Slap chop and its many forms that it's gone through in our hobby is a technique, or rather a method, for painting minis quickly to a high tabletop standard. I tried this method when I first got my hands on some of Army Painter's original speed paints, with varying levels of success. Some minis that looked pretty damn good, and some that were just kind of bad, and after that I kind of abandoned the concept of a purely speed paints based approach to painting. But I'm soon starting a new D&D campaign and I have a bunch of minis that I want to look really good on the table. But I don't want to spend hours and hours on each one, so let's try this again shall we? For this experiment I want to cover two quite different models. The first will be an NPC character, a bard that one of my players has designed on Heroforge. The other will be a rather large ogre from Archon Studios Dungeons and Lasers 5 Kickstarter. They're different sizes, yes, this helps set them apart, but they also have very differing sculpts. Our Heroforge model has much smaller details and tighter areas of colour, whereas our ogre has big flat areas like the muscles, where we will be able to put in large blocks of colour. So I think between these models I should get to see how this paint interacts with two quite different minis, and get to see how speed paint works with quite different surface types. While I'm getting the bard and the ogre primed and prepped with a dry brush of white, let's take a look at my previous attempts, and figure out what went wrong and how we can address those issues. My first issue, Vibrance and Saturation. For the Dragonkin Noble I picked two very different vibrant colours with high colour saturation, that are even pretty close in tone to go right next to each other. The red and the blue here are fighting for attention, so I think that making sure to either have just one vibrant colour, or to make vibrant colours complementary rather than contrasting will be the way to go. Second up, this spellcaster, either a sorcerer or a druid. The main issue with this model is tone. The various colours on the model are all very similar in tone, or brightness if you will. If those colours were all turned to black and white, they would all share the same shades of grey. This stops any part of the model standing out, and the whole thing just kind of blurs together. This reiterates the need to make sure there is contrast, not necessarily in the colours, but rather in the tone or brightness of those colours. I think overall the biggest issue I need to address here, speed paints don't do the thinking for you. You still need to be smart about your colour choices, dilute and mix to get the right variation of colour and tone even with a limited palette of speed paints. So with all that in mind, let's get to painting. The easiest way to ensure your colours will work on a model is to have a coloured image for reference. For this bard that's easy. The player that designed this model added colours in Heroforge and got the model to a point that it looks visually striking but balanced. This is something I won't have access to for the ogre, but we'll address that later on when we get to him. With speed paints, I find that there's two main things to keep in mind. One is to make sure you're working from the innermost details and coming outwards. Speed paints are translucent by nature, so if you're trying to paint an undershirt and accidentally hit some armour that you've already painted on top of it, it's going to leave a mark, and that's not easy to fix with speed paints. They tend to stain one another very easily, and that's not easy to fix unless you want to be pulling out some more normal acrylics. But that's not why we're here, we want to avoid mistake fixing as much as possible. And two, don't start on another colour until the current layer is dry. I've done this a few too many times. If you have two colours that are overlapping even slightly that are still wet, the speed paint medium will pull those colours together. This is great if you want to create nice blends really easily, but isn't so good if you have two very distinct colours next to each other that happen to start mixing into one another. So either be patient, or grab yourself a cheap hair dryer to help this process along. For our bard we'll be starting with his lighter blue undershirt. This is a subtle, somewhat desaturated colour that sits in many of this model's recesses, so I want to start here. For this I'm using the Beowulf blue speed paint, thinned down with equal parts speed paint medium to lighten the strength of the paint, giving us a more desaturated colour. You can use water for thinning speed paints, but I do find that the medium works better. It's what it's designed for, after all. Thinning with water can lead to the speed paints drying too quickly, which stops their medium, allowing them to sink into recesses. And I also noticed that it makes the speed paint more likely to pool in places where it shouldn't, such as on smooth flat surfaces. Moving on, we have two different shades of purple at work on this model, feeding into the idea of complementary colours that we mentioned earlier. A subtle blue alongside two differing purples sits nicely in a pretty complementary colour palette. We have a rich magenta for the main clothes on this character, and a more neutral violet lavender for his shawl and skirt piece. As the magenta is layered under the purple we will start there. Purple Swarm from Speedpaint 2.0 mixed with a tiny brush full of red. With this we'll pick out the various magenta details across the model, making sure to load my brush with enough paint that the colour will sink into the recesses, but not too much that it will pool and spill all over the model which has happened to me a few too many times.
and with the magenta done I reached for a bottle of my original speed paint. I could have easily mixed purple swarm with a drop of black and some blue and thinned it down, but I have a barely used bottle of 1.0 Hive Dweller Purple, which is a much darker colour that sits on the side of being a colder purple as it is. The issue with this colour here is that it is too dark, so I thinned it down a fair amount. I do think I slightly over thinned this as I was working. The raised areas were showing as almost untouched model, while the recesses were very dark. But knowing that I wanted to go over the shore with a dry brush later to make it feel slightly more flat like it does in the render, I figured it would be fine as long as this mix gave a good look in the recesses. 12 minutes into the paint job and most of our base colours are done, so now feels like a good time to throw some colour onto the base. A quick layer of 2.0 satchel brown goes over the shoes and floorboards, and again this is looking a little too dark, but I don't mind doing an additional dry brush here, as I would have done some dry brushing on the base regardless. While we have the brown loaded up I'll come in and touch up any other areas on the model that would need this, such as his hair, as they'll be a good fit for this darker brown. While I pick out the skin with 2.0 peachy flesh, now feels like a good time to mention that if you're finding this video entertaining or in any way helpful, please hit like down below to let YouTube know. And if you want to see more of my stuff in the future, from 3D printing to model painting, hit subscribe to stay in the loop, I've got plenty of fun projects planned. After a lick of broadsword silver over this layer, we can move on to those finishing touches. A quick but effective dry brush of Alien Purple from the Fnatic range does a good job of softening the colour on his shawl and skirt, and gives a much needed difference in texture on this model. Speed paint is great, but it does look very one note when it is all that you use on a model. So sometimes dry brushing even just one small detail of a model can break up that smooth look, and add some much needed difference in finish. After that I come in with a similar dry brush of fur brown on his shoes and the floorboards, and with a final lick of black around the base rim, our first mini is complete and around 30 minutes worth of total recording time. But before we look at final reveals and talk notes, let's shift our focus to our ogre. We don't have a direct colour guide or reference here, so instead I'm going to look for some images to help inspire the paint job. Various ogres and giant-esque creatures. Of course the official ogre and Etten from D&D, as well as some other images I liked the look of. I'm noticing that the colour choices that seem to make the most of these large areas of bare skin, making them almost a focal point, are the ones that use these pale desaturated, almost yellow skin tones. In mixing up a paint for this I wanted a peachy and believable skin tone, with a more muted and yellowed feel. The recipe I came up for is 4 parts peachy flesh, 2 parts pallid bone and 1 part speed paint medium. This created the skin tone we were after, but leaves me with just enough room to dry brush some additional highlights on if I want. As I think for this model, the skin is where I want to introduce some texture variation. Many of our reference images use various shades of browns and beiges for the clothing elements and accessories on their designs, but I want to add an element with a more vibrant pop of colour. The skin, leathers and wood on this model will all be in that range of brown tones, so introducing a more vibrant colour would be a great idea to give this paint job some interest. Looking at our reference images here, I like how this spot of red looks next to the browns on this artwork, so I think that might be our choice today. And I reckon a red will be a great choice. It will complement the existing colours without being too jarring of a contrast against our warm tone paint job. Luckily for us this ogre has two layers of cloth material, so we can make the bottom layer of this red, giving a nice vibrant colour that has just enough presence on the model to add some interest. With the red added, since I've been working on the innermost details up, I can now come back in and go over those last few brown areas that are on top before jumping over to the metallics. Speed paint metallics are great, but they don't quite behave in the same way as the other speed paints. They act more like you have done a layer of metallic with a wash over top, but it lets through a bit more sheen than it would if you were to do that process. I do think that the broadsword silver included in the starter set is quite dark, unless it's put over pure white, so that might be something I need to think about more in the future, especially considering the zenithal doesn't show through much here. And that's the ogre more or less done. If we were doing a purely slap chop approach, this would be him finished in 30 minutes. A large mini like this easily would have taken me a few hours with a normal layering based approach, so I think this is a great method. But I do think it'll be worth spending maybe an extra 15 minutes on this model to really boost it and make it pop. For the aforementioned dry brush over the skin, I pulled out Dorado skin, my go-to highlight for skin tones. 
but I realised it would be too peachy, and opted instead for Ancient Stone. This has a similar brightness as Dorado skin, but is much more of a grey yellow than a flesh tone, which should give the skin a nice finish and make it look closer to our reference images. I focused this mainly on the face, and a little bit on some of the more pronounced muscles. I decided the facial details are too big and noticeable not to pick out. So the teeth and eyes got a coat of white, which I followed up with pure pallid bone speed paint over the teeth, and dotted the eyes with black. And now we can move on to the base. A dark grey base coat, followed by a light grey dry brush and an ancient stone dry brush, and then a black wash. I picked out the details with metals and browns before adding a dab and a flick of true blood. I then scraped off some of the paint from the base so that I could use plastic cement and glued them together. For a 45 minute paint job on a model this big, it looks phenomenal, and I'm pretty stoked with that. And man, do they look good. So what's the takeaway here? What did we learn? Slap chop, or speed paints in general, are a great way to paint up minis fast, but not thoughtlessly. If you put in the effort beforehand to come up with a colour scheme, you can paint up some gorgeous looking minis in very little time. By picking colours that complement each other, and making sure that you have some variation in your saturation and your brightness, as well as your texture, if you don't mind doing a bit of an extra dry brush at the end. We, we know to be generous enough with our speed paints to let them do their job of sinking into the recesses, but not to be so heavy handed that they spill over into areas we don't want them. Make sure your current layer is dry before moving on to the next one, and work from the innermost details outwards as to not stain parts of the model you've already painted. And ultimately, I think that my biggest takeaway is to just take your time. Speed paints will already help you paint a model fast, no matter what. So there's no point in rushing it to save an extra one or two minutes. All you're going to end up doing is making mistakes that you have to come back and correct. And it's not easy to correct speed paint mistakes. Speed paints are already fast by nature, so there's no need to rush it further. All you're doing is risking making mistakes that'll end up making the paint job take longer. Having given the pseudo slap chop speed painting another go, I'm actually really happy with the results. I know damn well that that ogre would have taken me four hours if I'd painted it normally, but Today it took me 45 minutes, and to be honest it looks 90% as good as it would have if I'd done it with a standard layer based paint job. So I'll definitely be doing some of my NPCs or mob creatures like this in the future. Not all of them, mind you, I still want to take my time with a few minis, but definitely the ones that I want to get painted up fast, but still want them to look good on the table. So did you learn any useful tips? Maybe you saw something that I missed, or have something else to add to this conversation? Feel free to leave a comment down below with your experience with slap chop or speed paints as a medium. Leave a like if this video was entertaining or helpful in any way, and subscribe to see more of my hobbying in the future. Thanks for watching, and as always, have a good one.